Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Boeing shares uh, initially at their high up almost 4% today. They're off those levels, just up again about 1.2%. Uh, but we had some big news uh, early this morning, Tim. Yeah, CEO Dave Calhoun stepping down at the end of the year. Chairman Larry Kellner will not stand for re-election. Stan Deal, who's the embattled chief of Boeing's commercial airplane division, also departing immediately. Uh, he'll be replaced by Chief Operating Officer Stephanie Pope. All right, safe to say much work to be done as a plane maker continues to struggle to get a handle on a spiraling safety crisis. So let's get to our key interview uh, on this Monday. Bloomberg News Boston Bureau Chief Brooke Sutherland with us. She's followed industrials and the space for years. She's a writer for the Bloomberg Industrial Strength Newsletter. With us too, someone who knows so much about the aerospace and airline industry, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Aerospace Defense and Airlines Analyst George Ferguson. Hey Brooke uh, and George, I feel like not a surprise maybe the news today considering that a bunch of airlines had meetings with uh, Boeing's board last week, but uh, CEO Dave Calhoun was not a part of those meetings. Um, but let's go through it because it's important to understand the details. Brooke, let me start with you. Break down the news and changes, who is all leaving and what it means for this company going forward. Sure. So there's a it's a pretty sweeping leadership overhaul. So Stan Deal, who oversaw the commercial airplanes division, um, is retiring. He will be replaced by Stephanie Pope, who, as you said, had just been appointed to chief operating officer. Um, you also have the chairman of the board uh, who will not stand for reelection. And then CEO Dave Calhoun is planning to depart at the end of the year. Now, that is a pretty long time away from now, but they do not have a replacement yet identified. Um, for Calhoun. And I think that's really the key question as you figure out where Boeing goes from here and how it recovers is who do they get to fill that job? Yeah, so George, come on in on that. Where does Boeing go from here? And, and will these leadership changes at the top? And we don't know them all yet, as Brooke mentioned, we still don't know of a new CEO for Boeing at this point. Um, does that is that enough to turn the company around? Is that enough to fix Boeing? Well, so I don't think so, right? I think that what really matters is obviously sta stability of the production process and quality and, and uh, it, that's just going to take a little while uh, you know to, to push through to uh, I think reinforce their oversight uh, on the on the line uh, and, the, and the stability of that manufacturing process so I think that effort is ongoing and Dave Calhoun's obviously going to oversee that until he leaves I think that they, they could have got a shot in the arm here and they the markets are giving them a bit of the, of the shot in the arm already on, on bringing in someone new that they think will do a better job of this process. I think it's key for Boeing to bring in someone who's got a good manufacturing uh, resume, you know, who's focused on, uh, on quality manufacturing uh, and on, and on uh, a strong engineering culture. That remains to be seen, but clearly the markets are excited well, about just the fact that it's going to change from here. George, I want to come back to you, though. I, the first thing I thought about, I'm like, oh, Calhoun is out. Who's replacing him? And then I'm like, no, he's not stepping down until the end of the year. It's only the end of March. That's a long time. Are they just kind of buying time in your educated view uh, of this industry because they just weren't, they knew they had to kind of move him along, at least publicly? but they just don't have the right person yet, and that we should assume that they're gonna have a new CEO in sooner rather than later, because to me, as an outsider and observer, you need to have a new CEO in place. So sorry, that was for me? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, no worries, yeah, so I, I think the, uh, I think the board was a bit flat-footed here, right? And I think that's what, what I perceive of this long wait until uh, Calhoun leaves. You know, I, th I think uh, Calhoun had a number of people on the board that he, he was responsible for putting on there, maybe a little bit of loyalty. So I think it took the, you know, the outsiders of the airlines to show up and, and talk uh, to, the, to the board, frankly. And so, yeah, so I think they're flat footed. I think they they need time to figure out who they're going to bring in to replace Calhoun. I think it's going to be someone outside Boeing, again, someone with a resume that's strong in manufacturing and a strong engineering culture. Right. There's a lot to do this year at Boeing, so I'd hope that if they find someone sooner, maybe Calhoun even, even goes sooner because they're gonna put a lot in place 
this year that's going to matter a lot in the years down the road. Right. And Brooke, come on in on that. I guess that's my point. It's like, I just thought you got to have somebody new in that spot that as long as Dave Calhoun is there, I don't know, how do you perceive that? Or isn't that part of the, the problem that they need somebody new in charge? I mean, I think it sends a signal to say that he's departing at the end of the year. And, and Boeing is a company that is in need of um, signals right now, especially on hmm. the positive front, to show that they're taking action, that they're taking this seriously. And so I think this does that for them. But that was my initial point of like, well, it matters who you're going to get yeah. to replace him in terms of figuring out where this company goes. And I completely agree with George that it needs to be somebody with a real manufacturing expertise, somebody who is going to go line by line in that factory and get them to the point where they can deliver quality airplanes. Um, but I think, you know, that this is an important moment of accountability, but I do think it's striking that, you know, this is coming on the heels of the criticism from customers, those who determine ultimately how much money Boeing makes um, and what its market share looks like. Those are financial metrics. We've, of course, had very public criticism of Boeing from the FAA, which did an audit of its manufacturing line um, and has called upon the company to come up with a plan within 90 days to fix systemic quality control issues. We did not see this announcement come right on the heels of that FAA report. And so I think that is very interesting and sort of underlines what the challenge is here with Boeing's culture in terms of getting this company to be a real engineering manufacturing uh, enterprise again. It's also, I think, notable given that in 2021, the company's board actually raised the mandatory retirement age for the CEO from 65 to 70 with the idea that Calhoun would stay on uh, through a few more years. Um, here's what Dave Calhoun told uh, CNBC a little earlier today when asked about what he wants to see in the next CEO. Quote, I want somebody who knows how to handle a big, long, long cycle business like ours. It's not just the production of an airplane, it's the development of the next airplane. It'll be a $50 billion investment. I would like somebody who clearly has the experience inside our industry. Brooke, are there any names that are floating around the space right now based on your reporting? Any, any names come to mind of people or, or positions, uh, companies that, that they would come from at this point? I mean, I think that the best man for the job would probably be Larry Culp when you just look at the turnaround yeah. that he's been able to engineer at GE. Um, and the type of skills that Boeing needs are very similar to those that Larry has. He is a meticulous operator. Um, and that's really, you know, a big part of his turnaround effort at GE is going in and improving factory operations one step at a time, one small change at a time that really adds up to make a big difference in terms of how that company's operations are run. Now, Larry um, is on the cusp of uh, the final piece of the breakup of GE. He has had you know, a very successful track record there. I don't know if he is looking is his contract um, for, up for a brand new or challenge <laughs> of, of Boeing, <laughs> but we'll have to see. But he, he is obviously sort of the name that comes up just because of how much success he has had at GE. But you know, there's others out there that, um, I think we'll certainly enter the conversation. Dave Gitlin is on Boeing's board. He was a former uh, executive at um, United Technologies, which is now known as RTX. He now runs Carrier, um, which is an air conditioning business, but he obviously has a lot of aerospace manufacturing expertise and a connection to Boeing. Yeah, we've talked a lot with him, um, actually, on our, our air. George, come on in on who you think might be the kind of CEO um, or person out there that you think should maybe take over. And, and I do find it interesting in that interview on CNBC that Dave Calhoun said that um, he will have a say in the decision on a new CEO. I wanted to start there first, Joe, George. Does it make sense? I mean, you have to have the former CEO of Boeing who understands this company so well to help in that transition or, or no, or yes? Uh, so I think you, you would want the CEO to help you in the transition. And as far as names are concerned, I mean, I, you know, there's some people, I know some people that have been in the industry for a while, Shanahan down at Spirit mm. comes to mind, but he said he wants to get out of, the, out of the business, said his wife gave him a year to turn around Spirit. I think it's going to take longer, but uh, <laughs> uh, ultimately get bought. And then there's Ray Connor that used to run Boeing commercial uh, airplanes. He's a very smart person, but getting, getting up there in age in the, in the high 60s. Um, but I'm, I'm sure, you know, they're going to have to cast a, a wide net, but I'm sure there's somebody out there that's got the skills of like a Larry Culp that can come in and get the job done. That, that's the challenge is finding the right person. You know, Dave Calhoun's letter to employees, he wrote, the eyes of the world are on us, and I know we will come through this moment a better company. Um, George, let me start with you. What's it going to take for Boeing to come through this moment and really be a better company and not have in another year or two an issue? Uh, so I, I think what, what it's going to take is they're going to have to uh, change 
wholesale changed the culture at Boeing, right? The Boeing culture became too much about spreadsheet management, managers running the, the uh, you know, the different divisions, not having engineers involved in everything. Uh, I think they've really got to look at their business as all about building a quality product. You know, you can't totally give up on the financial metrics, but you have to loosen the financial metrics here because you're going to have to spend more money to train people to bring the next generation of workers into the aerospace uh, world and, and their managers. You're going to have to spend more money on oversight, which is those managers. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to get into the supply chain, stabilize the sp supply chain, not squeeze it. Look to develop it as well as, your, as, as if you're one team. Uh, and so it's going to take a relaxation of the everything's about the next penny uh, of mm -hmm. the bottom line mm -hmm. and more about how do we build the infrastructure to make great airplanes for the next hundred years. Brooke, I hear what George said just now, and I think to myself, we could have had this conversation in 2020, post 2018 and 2019, max crashes. Um, and indeed, a, a lot of the folks who leveled criticism against Boeing in the wake of those two accidents did mention a lot of what George just mentioned. This all to say that these aren't new issues at Boeing at this point, and these issues weren't necessarily created under Dave Calhoun. Does that mean that they have to go external to find someone brand new to come in and change the culture? I don't know that they have to, but I think that it would be helpful. And even with Dave Calhoun, he sort of branded himself as an outsider when he was brought in, but he'd been on the Boeing board since 2009. So this was a company that he had a lot of institutional knowledge and involvement in. And I think there's something to be said for fresh eyes at this point, to your point you know, the time to be talking about quality control issues and, and manufacturing at Boeing was after those first two 737 MAX crashes. Mm -hmm. um, we shouldn't still be having this conversation right. today, and, and yet we are. Um, and so that suggests that you do need something more dramatic um, to happen to really get to the core of, of what is going on at Boeing and, and how do you get back to making quality airplanes. But I do want to come back to what Carol was talking about from that letter, because it's not just a here and now, it is a forward looking question as well of where does Boeing go from here in the competitive landscape? They have lost a lot of market share relative to Airbus and they need to be thinking about what comes next. What is their next airplane? How do you get back to at least some level of equity with Airbus on a competitive landscape? Well, it sounds existential almost, Brooke. I mean, are we getting to that point that, you know, um, it's just too many mistakes and when you start to have carriers, you know, saying we're going to go elsewhere, I mean, it's about maybe the existence going forward longer term. Is that right? Is that how you're thinking about it? Sure. I mean, I don't think there's a world when air, where airlines want to only buy planes from Airbus. We're already in a right. duopoly, and, and that's not very helpful um, as it is. But certainly to make that more lopsided is not in those airlines' interests. And I think part of why they're so frustrated is because they need Boeing to be successful. They want Boeing to be successful, not just in terms of negotiating on some of these orders, but also in terms of getting the, the planes that they've already um, purchased um, right. and actually getting them delivered on time and, and without any kind of defects. And so I think, you know, it, it's also from a U.S. perspective. Boeing is a national champion. The, the U.S. needs Boeing to be successful. And I think that's why there's so much pressure and scrutiny right now. And in the end, I mean, I, I think everybody is rooting for Boeing to figure this out, but mm -hmm. they are the only ones that can really do that work. Right. George, you heard Brooke mention the way that Airbus has pulled ahead in, in recent years when it comes to the market. Would it be completely out of this world to, to look at Airbus as a place where the next CEO of Boeing could come from? Should we dismiss that? Yeah, I mean... Um Anything can happen, but uh, I get, uh, that one I think would be uh, very difficult. But there's a potential, I guess. There. <laughs> never say never. <laughs> never say never. Uh, one last thought. Hey, Brooke, just got 30 seconds. I want to go back to you on this. Um, what about like moving the headquarters back to uh, Seattle? Right? They went to Chicago, then they went to Virginia. That's a long, long away from where the product's actually made, just quickly. It is, and I think that that would be a smart, symbolic move on Boeing's uh, point, you need to go back to where the airplanes are manufactured and make sure it's clear that that's where your executives are focused. All right, guys. Listen, thank you so much. Really appreciate um, this deep dive. Boeing shares, by the way, still uh, up about 1.2%. Our thanks to Bloomberg News, Boston Bureau Chief Brooke Sutherland, uh, also writer for the Bloomberg Industrial Strength Newsletter, and of course, our Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Aerospace Defense and Airlines Analyst, George Ferguson. Guys, thank you um, so much. You know, it's interesting, though, like, what they talked about when you start to have airlines, you know, cutting some of their flight offerings because they don't have the planes that they need. Um, that's when airlines are like enough. No, like, those are the customers fix. of Boeing. We're not yeah. the customers of Boeing. We're the customers of the airlines. The right. airlines are the ones. But, it, but the trickle down of it. Yeah. Right?
You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Well, a little bit of news. I'm sure you know uh, we've been certainly reporting about it here at Bloomberg uh, when it crossed. Uh, A New York judge ruled Donald Trump's first criminal trial will start April 15th in Manhattan, getting the case back on track after a short delay that was caused when thousands of pages of new evidence emerged. And then also today, uh, Donald Trump vowed to post a $175 million bond in New York civil fraud lawsuit after an appeals court slashed it by more than two-thirds and handed him a crucial financial lifeline as state authorities were preparing to start using his assets. So that's kind of the latest on former President Donald Trump's legal backdrop. But there's other stuff going on. Yeah, in the meantime, there are a group of very, very well-known Wall Street and Silicon Valley folks who are either overtly or quietly embracing the GOP nominee for president and the prospect of returning to the political turbulence of the Trump era. This story, Carol, by Brad Stone. Brad, of course, the editor of Bloomberg Business Week, the author of several books, including two on Jeff Bezos, Amazon Unbound, and the Everything Store. Brad joins us right now from our San Francisco bureau. His story, by the way, featured in the new issue of Bloomberg Business Week. That's out on newsstands on the Bloomberg and at Bloomberg.com. Brad, great to have you here. Let's get to the who, the what, and the why of your story, because the story of the who alone reads like a who's who, it feels like, of Silicon Valley and also of Wall Street. So tell us about who's doing this and what they're up to. Right. Thank you, Carol. I was I was calling it the revolt of the winners <laughs> and this very conspicuous support among business leaders in, in tech and primarily on Wall Street for former President Trump. And as, as Tim described, there are kind of two brands of support. There's the overt support. And so you've got uh, Howard Lutnick of Cantor Fitzgerald and John Polson, uh, the uh, the the hedge fund owner uh, holding fundraisers for for uh, Trump Nelson Peltz uh, Disney foil who endorse uh, Trump recently and then the more subtle forms of, of support Ken Griffin from Citadel uh, saying on TV that Trump would be good for the capital markets and of course Elon Musk on on uh, the the service formerly known as Twitter almost every single day suggesting uh, that he's moving uh, in a rightward direction and uh, hasn't endorsed Trump, but is certainly putting a lot of distance between him and the current president. And as you mentioned in the piece, uh, you know, he's saying Elon Musk saying he hasn't endorsed and he won't donate to any political candidates. But uh, certainly a lot can happen between now and November 5th, Brad. So so what happened in, in terms of uh, this transformation for some of these folks over the last four years? There were quite a few after uh, January 6th who, who came out and distanced themselves from the former president. What has happened in your view over the last four years or over the last year to, to move people back to former President Trump. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, it, look, and there are plenty of, of uh, business leaders who are moving in the opposite direction and, and, and endorsing or supporting President Biden, and maybe in a future column, I'll look at that. Um, but there is uh, there is this movement. Another great example is Jeff Yass, by the way, from Susquehanna uh, uh, International, the, the Pennsylvania billionaire who may or may not own a portion of the company that has merged with Truth Social and given Trump a potential lifeline. He was once a never Trumper and mm. is now certainly making some news favorable to the former president. So look, I mean, I try to diagnose what's going on here. I mean, I think there's a couple things. Um, you know, in the in the case of Jeff Yass, maybe this is very transactional. You know. Trump has reversed his position on TikTok. Yes, is a major owner of ByteDance. I do think there's a sort of material concern here with some of these billionaires looking at at Biden's economic and taxation policies and 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 the the uh, idea that Biden raised in the State of the Union to uh, to instate a billionaire tax, to increase the corporate tax rate, to roll back the higher end of some of the Trump tax cuts. Um, there's Biden's antitrust agenda. Uh, there's the pro-labor stance and the fact that Sean Fain from the UAW was uh, was uh, a guest of the White House during the State of the Union and recognized by the president. Um, and, you know, to somebody like Elon Musk, who runs a non-union shop, these are existential concerns. So uh, I think we can get into what some of the emotional <laughs> well, reasons might be, but those are perhaps some of the rational decision-making that's going on right now. And I totally get the rational side. I love when you get into kind of the more emotional side of like, these guys are disruptors and they like when things kind of get, it feels like unsettling. Talk about that kind of thinking and why they may be providing support for uh, Donald Trump. 
Yeah, you know, I, I don't want to get too uh, far into the psychologist's office with this <laughs> analysis, but I think, you know, to some extent they feel like Biden, you know, maybe the Biden administration victimized them a little bit, uh, ran against the the 1% or the 0.1%. Uh, so they don't feel recognized. Um, I think this maybe reassessment of tech power and Wall Street power over the last decade, you know, left them feeling a little a little victimized. Um, and 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 yeah, and then there's the sense of being contrarians, being disruptors. You know, Peter Thiel made this contrarian bet uh, in 2016, and you know, to a certain extent, it backfired on him. But he got a lot of mileage out of it, and he had the ear of the president back in 2016. So perhaps some of these uh, business leaders or billionaires see where the political winds are shifting and want to have the ear of someone who they think, uh, despite. Uh, you know, the, the arguments for or against, it's someone, you know, who, who they might think uh, has a shot at winning the next election. And so they're trying to get on that side of history. I think probably for a lot of these folks, there are different reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think that we can dismiss the pure capitalism here and the idea that some of these folks just see a better tax regime and perhaps antitrust regime under Trump. Yeah, let's talk about the anti antitrust regime, because that is one area where President Biden has, you know, been, I think, in his view, pretty successful at this point. That's certainly a part of it, Brad. But I, I do wonder um, to what extent, you know, how these folks did over the last four years during President Biden, because Carol and I were talking about this a, a little earlier as we were preparing for this. And we were thinking to ourselves, you know, talking, talking with each other. Well, it's not necessarily like you know, yes, there was some rhetoric in the State of the Union, but it's not like there were policies put in place that actually hurt uh, these folks who you write about. Yeah, and I guess that's the question I had. You know, the, 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 the markets are going to determine a lot of the financial success uh, for some of these figures. I mean, you look at like Larry Ellison of Oracle, who ha has been reported to be dining with uh, President Trump as, as uh, Trump looks to improve his fundraising status. And, um, you know, like uh, the markets like predictability and what we do know, again, I'm trying not to be political here in my analysis, but what we do know is that, you know, President Trump historically and certainly it seems on the campaign trail brings an element of unpredictability and, and chaos and the markets don't like that. So I do think that, you know, some of these business leaders are trying to be opportunistic and they're embracing an agent of chaos. And it will be interesting uh, to see um, where that support goes, whether it wavers as we get into the real campaign season where, where people are paying attention and where the former president hasn't necessarily been as scripted as perhaps some of his handlers would like. I love this line in your story, um, in your reporting, Brad, you say um, billionaires aren't all that different from Trump's main constituency, uh, constituency of less educated working class white households. Both groups tend to see a conspiracy by far off elites who are out to deprive them of influence, um, expropriate their money and squander America's advantage abroad. Like it's interesting to see, like make that connection um, between those two groups. But uh, I, I don't know, it's just kind of very interesting and fascinating. You're right, we could bring in a lot of therapists and psychologists on this one, but it's fascinating that connection. It's one thing that I had never seen before and yeah. don't necessarily know how to interpret, which is the, the sort of venom that's out there, and maybe I'm paying too much attention to social media, among certain elites for other elites, for academic leaders. I mean, this was came clear in the battle against Harvard's, Harvard's president by uh, Wall Street leaders like Bill Ackman. Um, and this idea, this scramble for influence. Um, there's a great book, which I'll recommend, uh, Carol, I know you're a big reader, uh, but uh, a book called End Times by Peter Turchin, where he actually somewhat apocalyptically describes the end of regimes across centuries. And one of the telling tales of moments of instability has been when the elites start competing each other and battling for influence. So I, I don't know, maybe that's a, a little bit of a downer note to introduce. But I feel like Hunger Games sounds like seeing. a sweet movie in comparison. Don't worry, Brad. We're not going to end on that note, okay? <laughs> okay it's just it's too we depressing. Aren't? We're not going to we end aren't? on that note. No, I'm going to throw one more. Sunshine, flowers, one more in here. rainbows. Look, the election can go anyway. We have no idea how it's going to go between now and, and November 5th. Um, but we do know, and we do know that money plays a big role in politics. But uh, does the support of, of the folks you write about, Brad, any idea if it actually moves the needle when it comes to what matters, which, which of course is, is turnout and, and votes in these swing states? Well, and, and, and fundraising obviously does matter. And um, I'm not an expert in this, but you know, from what I read, 
President Biden is is out raising Trump, and I think that's one of the reasons why the Trump campaign has out been there soliciting either soliciting donations or having conversations with folks like Larry Ellison and Jeff Yass. And I don't know that any of them have necessarily stepped up. I mentioned the, the fundraiser that Lutnick and, uh, and Paulson were, were holding, I think, beginning of next month. Um, w- whether that support translates to the ballot box, I mean, mm. uh, Trump, the Trump campaign has to be careful, right? Because you don't, you don't want to necessarily turn off your, your broad base of, of supporters, working class supporters, by trumpeting uh, your, your billionaire support. So it's a careful line that they've got right. to walk. Right. And also in an industry, I feel like the tech world really knows how to play well with their enemies, their frenemies that they often work with. So could they just be hedging as you end the story, Brad, in terms of the outcome? Um, a really great read and a really timely read. Brad, thank you. Really appreciate it. Brad Stone, of course, the editor of Bloomberg Business Week. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Well, investors are certainly keeping an eye on the economic data this week and what it means for the broader market. In particular, those mega cap tech stocks that shape the momentum trade. And that's exactly where we go now, Carol, because this group of mega caps have had their own market branding. First, it was the Fang stocks. Mm-hmm. Then it was the Mag Seven when newcomer Nvidia joined the crowd. Now, how does this how does this ring? Okay, <laughs> I'm listening. Magnificent Two, the Middling Two, and the Math Three. I mean, gosh, it's like... It doesn't necessarily have the same ring to it. It's a great name for a garage band, don't you think? (laughs) Yeah, it is. All right. As investors have come to focus on the importance of AI, NVIDIA, and Meta have surged ahead. Microsoft and Amazon have done reasonably well. And Apple, Tesla, and Alphabet have been trailing, uh, Tim, the S&P 500. Eric Weiner is Equities America's team leader for Bloomberg News. He writes about this for Bloomberg Business Week, along with Jaron Wittenstein and Mark Gurman, uh, how the Blazing 2 and Tepid 5 are starting to emerge. The story, by the way, featured in the new issue of Business Week magazine. You can get it on newsstands. Get the story on the Bloomberg Terminal and at Bloomberg.com slash Business Week. So we've talked a lot about the rise of AI, NVIDIA, like, and of NVIDIA certainly ahead of the pack. Uh, Meta Platforms doing incredibly well also. Are we to the point, Eric, where we just have to sort of give up this moniker of Mag7 because Tesla is doing so poorly? Well, the the bigger question is, does Tesla even belong? I mean, the, the idea of the Mag7 really is the the big tech stocks and then what's been driving big tech. And ever, ever since really AI reared its head as a driver middle of last year, that's been sort of moving everything up. So the market has kind of been riding on that. You can see it in chips right now. Um, Tesla doesn't do that. Tesla's problems are uh, its own, completely opposite of, or completely separate, say, from the group. Apple is a different dynamic. Apple is falling into exactly, you know, it's at the bottom end of the Magnificent Seven, if you want to call it that or whatever, for for a very magnificent seven reason. Whereas Apple, is, when you're dealing with uh, Tesla, you're talking about EV adoption, you're talking about infrastructure, you're talking about right, you know, things that the other companies right. Don't all have they to don't deal, deal, with. deal with that. Yeah. They don't deal with that. Um, Apple, on the other hand, this is something that we were seeing a long time ago. They weren't getting punished for it, uh, and then people figured it out, and that was that they aren't really growing. Uh, and if they don't, the bet, the long-term bet on Apple would be that they are going to be the ones that are going to elegantly figure out how to get AI into our pockets. Mm-hmm. And if anybody's going to do that, you know, Apple's products are going to do that. And that's your long-term bet. But if you're looking at them right now, they have a very orderly, very revenue-heavy in business that just churns it out. But the growth is not there. And like when you're talking about what people were buying into with Apple, they were buying into a perpetual growth machine. And if you're not going to get more people to buy iPhones, you're not going to get more people to buy their products, where is that growth going to come from? NVIDIA answers that question. Meta answers that question. Apple less so. Are you making though a decision or investors kind of making a decision by saying, okay, AI 
is the idea, the technology that we all have to jump on board and it's going to be what everything else is measured off of. Are we smart to do that already? Oh God. Um, well, so I, I, my, my first book was an oral history of Wall Street and it went through every boom since, yeah. the, since 1929. And this is normally what happens, which is that technology, I mean, you can go back to like people making photocopies and it, Xerox being like seen as you know revolutionary. So it's always kept, because the stock market is a forward looking mechanism and it's got all this hope into it. The idea is like, what's going to be the next thing and how early can I get in on that? I, AI, appears to be the next thing. However, there have been other next things that have not panned out. And that's where you kind of have to wonder if that, like, is this the right. dot-com moment or is this not? And uh, we have yet to really see it because even at the beginning of the dot-com moment, you couldn't necessarily see what it was about to become. Because I guess I just think about Fang, right? Facebook, Apple, yep. Amazon, Netflix, Google. Like, they all weren't the same kind of company, right? Like, we just, we have this love of, like, grouping people into a cute little, you know, word and then kind of trading around it. I get it that they're massive companies, right? And they are great momentum, you know, drivers, if you will. So I'm just, I guess I'm trying to think about like how we need to think about the market and the importance of classification of, of some of these names. Investment strategists love to do this. So you can think about the BRICS where they did yeah. it on, on geography. Yeah, you know, Russia, the, India, and China. Yeah, you're putting together various different things and creating a thesis around it. But if you're actually looking at the market, what you kind of want to do is go beyond that yeah. and look into what each each valuation is and what their growth prospects are. Because you, you need to time when you're buying and you also need to time what you're buying. Does it also tell us any sort of story about indexing and the index, given that the S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index and it's overwhelmingly uh, turns out to be these top companies? That is ac absolutely it. So when you think about what we're doing, when every every day, all of our 401ks and all of all, all the things that are index related, this pressure just piles in. All of these, all of these uh, fund managers and uh, passive managers need to step in and buy these stocks because the index is weighted that way. Mm -hmm. So the more that this gets centralized, the more that centralization moves things up. What we're seeing now is the market kind of sort of fluctuating in terms of the numbers. It's not climbing as much, but the rest of the market, if you look underneath the hood, there's a lot of growth. There's right. a lot of companies that are moving, right. but they're not showing up in the at the index level because they just don't have the weighting. So do we do a, an injustice maybe as media, right? And whoever, or whoever comes up with these and then we all jump on board, right? Because as you say, we've talked about the market, the gains broadening out and the importance of all of these other names that are out there. So do we do an injustice of kind of trying to classify some of these guys I, I think it's simplistic I think I think what you guys are trying to do in getting behind it is the actual right answer but like, like thank so you if, you can come back yeah. <laughs> Open door. no but in all seriousness like if you thank look you. at the Sox index you look at what chips are doing and you, you start mm -hmm. to wonder is that good for the market where is that going to show up it, it's it's not that simple and but we tend to tell a simple story because that's the easiest way for people to understand the market no and I also think it's really smart to kind of as we go through this AI crazy euphoria reality if you will like to understand each company that even though they drop the phrase or something but what does it really mean for their business going forward uh, do you remember when do, the dot-com era was going on and pet stores pet were, were yeah exactly <laughs> pet stores are technology companies exactly the puppet is probably the, exactly well, we know it is um really fun thank you eric Wiener, for me. equities america's team leader at bloomberg news joining us in studio you're listening and watching bloomberg business week and this is bloomberg you're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. As I mentioned, it's the company behind the theme park's Legoland, Madame Tussauds, Peppa Pig theme park, the London Eye, and many more. In fact, it's got parks and attractions in 23 countries around the world, serving more than 60 guests per year. It's called Merlin Entertainments, formerly a publicly held company, now owned by Blackstone, the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board and more. we got the CEO with us. We do indeed, right next to us. Uh, Scott O'Neill, he's CEO at Merlin Entertainments. He's joining us here in our studio. Scott, also previously president of Madison Square Garden Sports, 
which was, of course, owner of the Knicks, Rangers, Liberty, and more, and the CEO of Harris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment, which includes the Philadelphia 76ers, New Jersey Devils, and more. Scott, sorry, we've run out of time. Look at you guys you, having you the whole background in. <laughs> sorry, we've done your bio. We're no, done. That's, that's, um, not, that's not everything. <laughs> how are you? You know, I, um, I'm pretty happy. Uh, I moved to the UK. It's been a big adjustment. Do you like that? I do. I didn't anticipate how, how challenging the move would be. I've grown up in this little bubble between New York, Philly, Connecticut, New Jersey, and... Um, what was challenging? The weather or just different? I just think... Uh, well, I have a... My youngest is 17 years old, so taking a 17-year-old out, I just have to tell you one quick story. Yeah. Is, um, you know, we're having that heart-to-heart, that father-daughter connect conversation, and she, she holds up her finger and points in my chest and says, <laughs> Dad, let me get this straight. Your career is more important than my happiness. <laughs> and she turns and just walks out of the room. And I was like, but, but I love you. I mean, so, I love you, honey. Bye, Eliza. So that transition was harder than we thought. <laughs> but she's happy now. She's, she's happy she's now. Driving. That's what she's I was She's in gonna London ask. with you? She's in London with me. Okay. She won an international basketball championship, gold medal. Score. What? Congratulations. So she's doing great. She's, she's thriving. My wife's happy. So, yes. Yeah, so life's good. Dad. She's good. You'll, <laughs> can you imagine? She's good. I can tell Boy, you. right in my chest. Boom, boom. <laughs> She'll never forgive you, like but that's no. okay. No. Yeah, that's okay. Um, you know, your business is all about leisure and discretionary spending. And you've got a great view around the world because you're in, what, uh, more than 20 countries at this point. 23 countries. So just give us an idea of how things are going when it comes Who's to that spending spend. spending and doing stuff? Yeah. Well, we're pretty fortunate. Um, for those of us who had children in COVID... Um, it was a little close when we couldn't leave the house. <laughs> and when COVID ended, we got on planes as, as quickly as we could. But the one thing we were searching for was connection and meaning and memories. And we moved away from the economy of things to the economy of experiences. And so we have a lot of tailwinds. Um, it, it is a, it, look, it's, it's, we go from Malaysia, Korea, Japan, China, all the way to the U.S. and everything in between. Yeah. And so we get to see quite a bit. So whenever people are like, how's business? I'm like, in which so where, part of so the world? Is it, so it's, where is it bad? Yeah. China is, is tougher than we anticipated. We anticipated even this year a recovery a little bit quicker than, it, than it's come. So people are doing it or is it just at a fraction of what it was? It's just slower. Yeah. Yeah. Domestic um, tourism slower. Their international tourism coming out of China is a bit more than we thought. Mm. Uh, U.S. is still fine. The U.S. is great. I mean, the U.S. consumer... We're wonderful people. You know, we spend money? We do love to spend money, and we love experiences and memories and, and fun things. So, does, so does that, that part mean of we're at pre-pandemic for you guys? We're like, over pre-pandemic. Over pre-pandemic Yeah, both levels. in terms of revenue and, and, and volume. And, it, and the UK is a little schizophrenic. Uh, very good for internationals last year. This year it's a little slower. Domestics is, is slow, and Europe's slow. Now, remember, we had bizarre weather last year. Okay, yeah. so... You know, most of our peers, Disney and, and Universal, and I know you've never, most people listening maybe haven't heard of Merlin Entertainments before, but we are the number two theme parks and attractions business in the world. Does that frustrate you that, like, if you think about so many of those names, Legoland, uh, like we just went through them, I mean, they're well known. Our if brands you kids, are great. But, but that the recognition. It's coming. Okay. It is coming, but, like but a freight train. <laughs> but does it even matter if these brands aren't necessarily connected to one another does. that people know that Madame Tussauds is owned by the same folks who own Legoland? I think it does. I think when, when you talk about, not to be um, too technical, but we are at Bloomberg, you know, when you talk about EBITDA meeting multiple, yeah. when you think about how do you grow your multiple, one of the things that, that I think matters to Disney is their brand. You know, and I think one of the things that matters to Universal are the licensed partners, the brand IP partners. And you look at ours, Agreed. you know, you take, you know, I, personally, I'd take Legoland and Peppa and Madame Tussauds and I, I'd put them up against there. So I, and I, and we're dragging behind them. Now we're, we're way ahead of our, the, the U.S. regional theme parks, like the Six Flags and the Sea Worlds and the Cedar Fairs in terms of multiple. But I, I think we've got a, we have a, a, a journey ahead of us to, to map that, the brand and the experience Is there a to where we are. the movie or something? Like, like, how do you know? No, I'm serious. There, like, there could be some content around it, right? So we have a lot of different brands, and so, so yeah. we, we we have to take a portfolio approach, right. For sure. But yeah, I, I did. I get, wasn't being facetious. I know, I, I know. Just, I, I we did. Talked I did. To the Mattel CEO. We a lot talk about the Barbie movie. You know, he's amazing. Yeah, he he's an amazing, is. amazing executive for but sure. But just like how you kind of you know capitalize on all of that. Yeah. Well. Um, well, there are a whole host of things. You know, I I'm I'm following a founder, Sir Nick Varney. He's knighted. 
pretty And I sick. thought to myself, could that be me someday? <laughs> so like when your daughter comes out here, yeah. you'll say, yes, I'm taking the she job, but it's sir. I don't it's think, sir, honey. No, I somehow don't it's think sir that's going to happen. Maybe she'll um, have to stay at school and take a test uh, yeah. When, yeah. during the ceremony. Yeah. That, that could happen. <laughs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves, um, though. Um, uh, so, so following a founder... Is, there's so many wonderful things, and I come from a family of founders, and my brothers and sisters have all uh, founded companies. I'm the only sellout in, out of the five of us, and um, and and um, the, the 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 magic, the the stuff. Um, you can't see this on the radio, but the the, the feel of the business that you have as a founder. You're on streaming, year actually. You're on YouTube and streaming. Oh, so. bam! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so so um, there's so many wonderful things, and they feel the business so well, and a lot of stuff becomes intuitive, and and that's hard. And they have like this father or motherly like figure you know mm -hmm. like a larger than life figure and so to come in after that there are a whole host of challenges culturally etc with with leadership um, but there's also usually these gaping holes of opportunity and because the founders have such uh, rhythm and intuitiveness in the business you have things that I think can really underpin future success like like digitizing the business like driving data like uh, dynamic pricing, like the stuff that I've, I've my whole life have made made a business of, mm. come into a new business and you think, my, you know, my eyes are as big as saucers and I'm thinking, okay, there's enough opportunity. When you think about the different types of products that you offer, the different attractions that you have, what's growing and what's struggling right now? Like where's the opportunity for growth? Yeah, well in, in Legoland, that's about 40% of our business, Legoland Resorts, there are 10 of them, three in the US, um, Korea, um, Japan, Malaysia, Dubai, Germany, Denmark, London, etc. Um, we're building a, a one in Shanghai and in, in China as well. It's a really good business, um, and we, we have to invest in, in it's a making great brand. it more premium. It's like, oh man, sorry, but go ahead. That brand is wonderful. Just well, the recognition. They know, and, and the, the, you know, Niels, who's the CEO there, just understands the brand and how to grow it. And their partnerships are smart, and they're wonderful people, and they know how to do deals and drive deals. And, and they're one of our largest investors. Um, and so, so that's an unbelievable opportunity, but we have to continue to invest, invest, invest. How do you make that more premium? Um, that's what we're finding is like, there is a flight to quality, premium's gonna matter. Our resort theme parks business, a lot more complicated. It's kind of like, if you could imagine a Six Flags dropped in Europe, that's what we have in Europe. And, and I'm, I'm of the school of bigger is better. So mega resorts will matter mm -hmm. and regional ones will really struggle. And so we're, we're on the effort of that. And then where I think there's the max growth from us, we had over 20% growth in this segment, we call it gateway. Mm. And, and London is the best example. We have two, what we call must see, must do, we call them anchor attractions. The London Eye, by the way, uh, and Madame Tussauds, the original. Mm -hmm. And then we have three other attractions. One out of every four tourists into London come to one of our attractions. And 40% of them come to at least two. So that's what I call like cluster penetration. And building those in the 10 most important tourist cities in the world is where I think our growth is going to come from. Um, just got a minute left, man. I wish we had 10 more minutes Me left. Me too. Um, I got to ask you, though, with your sports background, do you miss it? Hmm. Being actively involved in like running a, you know, a team and so on and so forth? There are elements sports? I love and miss. It's mostly about the people. Yeah. You know, in terms of when you, when you hit a certain level at those jobs, it becomes a different type of job. And, and if you compare that type of job to this one, it's not even close. I mean, I've got people, purpose, and scale, which is what I'm looking for. I'm like learning every day. I was in that business for so long, I knew it. And I wanted to, I wanted to stretch a bit. Um, 30 seconds left, are you gonna add to, go back to your current job? Is there stuff to add to the portfolio? Oh yes. So yes, acquisitions yes, yes. will be coming? Yes, well, we, we just bought the Orlando Eye yeah. um, in Icon Park. So if you're down in Orlando, swing by. It's a great respite from the, uh, the difficulty sometimes of grinding through a resort. We have a Legoland Resort down there as well. Um, but yes, more to come. And that's going to be a, an anchor for our Orlando cluster. Good to know. Good to know. Come back soon. Come see me and at my bring, resort to attractions. And bring that daughter. I will bring her. <laughs> she will actually love it, but it might be a longer show. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Scott O'Neill, thank you so much. Chief Executive Officer of Merlin Entertainment joining us right here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. I'm driving in my car. I turn on the radio. How about you let me drive? Oh, no. No, no, no. Who's going to drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. It's the question that drives us. Drive this is the drive to the close. That funky music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio.
All right, everybody, just under 18 minutes left in today's trading session, uh, the Monday trade on this March 25th, 2024. Carol Messer, along with Tim Stenovic here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Um, John, we just broke down the numbers, kind of bouncing around. We're off, uh, I don't know, it's just a little change, a little bit lower here overall, Tim. Yeah, um, yeah. Dow down four tenths of a percent. The S and P yeah. five hundred, a uh, down close to two tenths of one percent. I want to see what Sarah Ponsek has to say about all this. She's financial advisor with UBS Private Wealth Management. She joins us on Zoom from Boca Raton, Florida. Sarah, how are you? I'm great. Great to be with you too. Full disclosure: Sarah, formerly our colleague mm -hmm. here at Bloomberg, before she decided to move to a sunnier place that's warm <laughs> year round I, that maybe I on days like today when talking about buying a snow shovel yeah. and I, I was not jealous at all. Like, no <laughs> snow shovels, honest. no snow shovels, no snow Boca. shovels for me right now. Although we did have, we did have plenty of rain over the weekend. If it makes you feel a little better, it does make me feel better, but so did we. So, yeah. you know, no, no comparing <laughs> notes here. Um, Sarah, what's up uh, when you look around right now and, and you see an S and P 500 that's up, close to 10% on the year. Um, what are you telling folks about diversification, about where opportunities are, about how they should play this out? So it's pretty amazing. Coming into 2024, I think the majority of us were saying, all right, the outlook looks pretty good here still. The Federal Reserve is expected to cut interest rates, but the economy still looks strong. Inflation's moderating, corporate profits are holding up. But with that said, we're probably not gonna see stock market gains at the same pace at which we saw them in 2023. And here we are three months into the new year and we've seen 20 new record highs for the S&P 500, as you mentioned. We're, we've already seen double digit returns and it just continues. So to your question of how investors should play this out, what we're telling clients about diversification, it's a bit of a two way street because on the one hand, tech led much of the rally, as you know, last year and the beginning of this year. We have seen a broadening out, um, but tech is still so important in clients' portfolios. I mean, and we believe that it's a huge risk for clients to be under invested and under exposed to tech. But with that said, that doesn't mean tech's your entire portfolio and you do need to be diversified. So well, it goes both ways. Well, let's talk to it. I mean, what is the, and I understand every investor, you know, has a specific situation, right? In terms of what they're, investor in, or investment objectives are, Sarah. But having said that, what's a good allocation and how you think about it? And then let's also say, not all tech is created equal. So when you say Absolutely. tech, what do you mean by it specifically? Absolutely. So when I, when I was just speaking about tech and not being underexposed to tech, that's just large cap US tech broadly. You don't want to be underexposed to US tech. And when I say underexposed, I mean, tech has come to be such a large portion of the indexes. So you don't want to have less than the index's representation in tech in your portfolio. Now there's a, another subsector of tech and that would be small or mid cap tech or also other areas of the technology ecosystem that would be or would see a, a major tailwind from AI revenue. I mean, we've been talking about generative AI now for over a year. Uh, it's not a buzzword anymore. It's just become part of the daily lingo, it seems like. But there's reason for it. I mean, our chief investment office estimates that AI revenues are going to expand by 70% per year until 2027. And it's not just the magnificent seven stocks that are going to benefit from that. There's other areas as well. So you need to make sure that you're looking to other companies, other areas of the tech ecosystem that could be the next big thing, but that are also seeing revenues to prove it. I, now, in addition to that, no, oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Carol, go yeah, ahead. No, 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 finish up. I was go just going to say, it's not, it's not all tech. If we're looking at diversification within the stock market, look, you want to have exposure to other sectors too. If we highlight two as of right now, uh, two areas that we do like are healthcare. It has you know, defensive components, but we've also see a lot of uh, a major boost from everything going on with weight loss drugs and there, therefore, uh, and also industrials, you know, we like cyclical areas of the market as we do expect this this rally is going to broaden out as we have seen so far in 2024. I had to jump on when you use the term Magnificent Seven because we had a great conversation with our Eric Weiner, who is our Equities Americas team leader here at Bloomberg News. And he and Jaren uh, Wittenstein and Mark Gurman have a story out in the new issue of Bloomberg Business Week. And they say 
This year, the Magnificent Seven has looked more like the Magnificent Two, the Middling Two, and the Meh Three. Um, and he talks about uh, the importance of AI, NVIDIA, and Meta, which have all surged ahead. Then you've got Microsoft and Amazon that have done reasonably well. And then the other three have trailed the S&P 500 index. So, you know, um, you're super smart. And I think about when you were here at Bloomberg, like we could just get into the weeds of things. Like it's important that we be careful, right? Like if we say Magnificent Seven, they're all Absolutely. not really magnificent this year. And this is why when I say like when we talk about tech, we've got to kind of drill down and understand the particulars of each name. You're absolutely right, Carol. And look, they were all back this in 2023, but that's not going to continue forever. And something we always love to remind clients of is, and we're experiencing it right now too, when you see a year like 2023, in which you have you know, companies, which many people know very well just from everyday life, but then they're hearing the, about them every day on the news, or they're reading about them in the financial media, or they're seeing their stock prices excel every day. You know, clients say, I want more of that. I want more of that. And it's important to remind clients that, you know, say you went back to 2000, if you look at the five largest companies from back in 2000, how many of them are still, you know, some of the top companies today? The answer is only one, actually. Hmm. Um, so, it, yeah, you know, these these companies are are amazing, and if you look at the revenues that they're putting up, they're amazing. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be at the top of the leaderboard every single day, every single year. Right, and then it it kind of makes finding the next ones, Sarah, that five years from now will be at the top of the leaderboard even more difficult. Right, and that and that's why. You know, we like looking at different, you know, thematic type of investments that give clients exposure to small and mid caps within the technology space as well. So you're not only concentrating your portfolio in whether you want to call it the Mag 7 or, you know, the Mag 2 this year, or the right. Midling 5. Smart. Um, but Whatever that way, time. you're not just looking at, you know, 3, 5, 7, the eight. Meh. The math math three. Math three, middling two. <laughs> um, Sarah Ponsek, always good to uh, hear your voice and check in with you. Financial advisor over at UBS Private Wealth Management, joining us there from Boca Raton, Florida. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.